Hi, everybody. I'm Jane Marie. Um, we're going to be talking. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about scoring, not the sex kind, but the music kind today. Um, yeah, and how to do it legally and have fun with your music in your podcast. So, yeah, a little about me. Um, I'm, I guess I'm introducing myself. <laughs> I consult as a music supervisor on This American Life. Um, yeah, did the first season of Serial. Um, you guys know that song. I should have played it, but <laughs> um, I'm also the host of Tinder's podcast through Gimlet Media. It's called DTR. It's very dirty. You should listen. Um, and I have a production house here uh, I co-founded called Little Everywhere. We're in Atwater. We are a recording studio and podcast, podcast production house. Um, you all have one too, I'm sure, is what I've heard. Um, so today we're going to talk about scoring. Um, and some of my philosophies about it. Uh, so back in the early days of podcasting, um, you could just put whatever you wanted on your podcast because no one was listening. And <laughs> before that, uh, we could use any music we wanted on the radio because everyone owns the airwaves and we just paid a fee into ASCAP and then it got distributed to musicians somehow with some magic robots. Um, but now that podcasts are something people can possess, as they would a CD or a record or a tape back in the day, um, we need to license music because it's the right thing to do, for one. Um, musicians don't make money the way they used to with album sales and stuff, so it's just nice if you're going to use their creative work to credit them and pay them appropri uh, appropriately. But also because if you're making a podcast my philosophy anyway, is you want it to be so good and so popular that everyone's listening to it and then they want to sue you if you fuck up somehow and don't get the right license <laughs> for something. So that should be your goal, is to just have such great success that Warner Brothers and Universal Music Publishing Group come after you. Um, but hopefully you've gotten all the right licenses and you don't have to pay them anything. Uh, so... Um, yeah, so I'm of the, again, philosophy that don't use anything without permission. Um, and so we're going to talk about how to do that today. You can still do whatever you want, but just know that I'm judging you. Uh, <laughs> so um, there's a few ways to get music for your podcast. Uh, one that I think a lot of people know of but don't realize isn't actually free is called the freemusicarchive.org. Um, it's a good resource if you're a small podcast and you aren't going to have like a huge distribution platform. But even within the Free Music Archive, there are six different types of licenses and you need to really re read the fine print on every song. Um, some of them will say, you can use this song as long as you credit the artist um, and the song name in full in the credits of your show. Or you can use this song as long as you credit the artist and the name of the song and the record label and call them and tell them that it's happening and then take it off the internet exactly one year later. Um, there's a lot of legal stuff still in there with free music. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about other ways to get music today. Uh, one is music libraries. There are a bunch of really crappy ones out there and then there are some really good ones that have actual people you can call on the phone and try to make deals with. Um, uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. Um, you can work with composers, which was what we did on Serial. Uh, I called a friend, Nick Thorburn, and just said, we need a theme song. <laughs> and I don't know how to talk about music, but here's kind of the things that we like and how music will work on the show, and can you come up with something? And offered him a flat fee for that. Um, and then there's going out and licensing popular music, so which is the hardest thing to do. Um, and the most expensive. So uh, yeah, primarily for most of my projects, we do music libraries, good ones, or work directly with a composer. Um, and some of those composers are famous people, and some of those composers will be famous people later. So the, I look for the latter, if you, find, <laughs> if you can find them. Uh, so these are some of the music libraries that you can look into. My very favorite over here is Audio Network. Um, what I like about them is their fees are pretty low. It's around $300 a track. Uh, but you can get better deals than that if you call them directly. And uh, their library 
uh, is has a lot more feeling than some of these. It almost sounds like the music is being made by a machine or something. Like that doesn't have a lot of emotion. There's not a lot of heart in it, and it's just loops. Nothing changes in the song. You've got 16 bars of the exact same thing, and then that's just looped five times, and then that's your track, which doesn't work for me. Um, when I'm searching for music, I'm looking for something that has a very simple opening, like maybe one or two instruments, um, and has its own eight to 16 bars that I can loop in Pro Tools. But then instrumentation grows and, and adds on and becomes more, more interesting, and then there's like some kind of emotional change somewhere in the music. Um, just to give myself some options in mixing. Uh, if nothing changes in the song, then I can only use it in one place in one way, and it's really boring and not, I'm, I'm not getting my bang for my buck that way. Um, so I like that about Audio Network is that they're real musicians. They're, it, the songs can have heart and feeling in a way that a lot of other um, libraries don't, so check them out. Uh, this is not an ad for Audio Network, but, <laughs> but I've just found them to be really great. Um, so the pros and cons of working with a library, again, are like the emotional stuff is kind of lacking. Also, some of the larger ones have millions of songs to comb through, and they are labeled in the dumbest ways, <laughs> where it'll be like, put in a search term, and you're like, sad Afro-funk, 70s to 80s, uh, marimba, you know, <laughs> and then it's just like, it gives you every single one of those search terms. So um, what I do is try every week just to go to the libraries and go through their new releases, just to familiarize myself with everything that's out there uh, and try to keep on top of it that way. And then if I get bored some days, I go way back into the archives, but um, there's, there's just a massive amount of music out there. You can expect to pay between one and if you want a yearly um, subscription to any of these libraries, they're like between one and five thousand dollars for like an individual. But if you're using a lot of music, that one thousand dollars gets you a ton because you're using it all year. You know, you can download. It's like unlimited downloads for a really small production. So just call them, try to work something out. They're not like set fees. Most people will work with you depending on your project. And uh, so, yeah, so that's the libraries. Then there is working with composers, <laughs> which is, if you don't know anything about music, can be really hard. Um, I'm not a musician, which is why I'm not making the music that I'm working with. <laughs> if I was, I probably wouldn't have to do any of this. Uh, but what I've been doing most often that works with composers is putting together a Spotify playlist of stuff that I like and just saying here, these things usually work. If I had all the money in the world, this is the Philip Glass song I would want on my show. Or, you know, here's, here are 10 tracks that, that really are the vibe of my program. Um, can you make stuff kind of like that? And in those negotiations, people want between anywhere, you know, if they're like a no-name artist, they'll take a couple hundred bucks a track. Um, if they're somebody more popular, they'll take a couple thousand dollars a track. You just have to kind of work it out with these folks. But the nice thing about that is because they're composing it for you, you own the music afterwards. Um, you can let them retain ownership as well, but you're not like splitting up publishing and master and all this stuff. You're actually buying a physical product from the composer. Um, and those kind of deals are just really nice because you can use it, the music however you want for as long as you want. Um, so I really recommend working with Composer if, pop, if possible. The only thing to know about that is that you have to decide on rounds of notes just to make their life a little bit easier. Tell them, oh, I'll give you two or three rounds of notes, not 10, not 20. We're not going to work on this for a year. It's not a real album. It's just for my podcast. <laughs> uh, so the other thing uh, is to know uh, just explore a little bit what you like about instrumentation. Um, I, I made the marimba joke, but I'm so sick of marimba. I, it's just like that plinky plonky thing that everybody has everywhere right now, and I'm over it. So no more marimba for me. Try to find that stuff out for yourself and go to the composer and let them know, because often with radio stuff, they'll reach right for their marimba. Um, <laughs> The other, oh, one more thing is that, I, that you can ask for is a sound alike. You can say, oh, we had this placeholder music in here, this song uh, from, you know, uh, some radio head jam or whatever, and we want something just like that. That's kind of called a sound alike, and you can ask for that. 
I think it's kind of cheating, um, but that there's nothing actually legally wrong with it. It's just lazy, but you can do it <laughs> if you need to. If you're really, really, really attached to a vibe and can't get the license, you can ask a composer. There's plenty of composers who specialize in sound alike, so you can put composer sound alike Los Angeles into Google and find people who do this all day long. They take popular music and make a slightly different version of it. It's basically everything you hear on MTV is a sound alike like the bed music on all the reality shows, um, you'll hear it and you'll be like, wait, I feel like that's a Kendrick Lamar song. No, it's kind of like a Kendrick Lamar song. <laughs> that's because they've hired someone to make something that sounds exactly like a Kendrick Lamar song. Uh, so, now we're gonna talk about licensing. So, um, that's composers. For licensing, you just need to know a couple of things. One, um, you never know who owns a song. <laughs> So ASCAP has this search engine where you can find out who owns how much of which parts of what song. And you need to contact every single one of those people if you're going to license a track and pay them what they ask or negotiate with them. Um, as an example, I looked up Broccoli by Dram and Lil Yachty, and there are all of these people own some portion of broccoli. So, and all of them can ask you for however, like BMG Gold Songs is probably gonna ask you for 20 grand for their part, and so on and so forth. So um, don't license broccoli, just kidding. But you, <laughs> this is the search that you need to do when you license any song, even if the song is by your boyfriend or whatever, and he's like, I'm in a famous band, but you can use whatever you want. He doesn't know that. Um, he doesn't know if his lead singer sold all of their publishing rights to Universal Music Publishing Group. He doesn't know. Also, he doesn't know if he sold his future publishing rights for songs that haven't even been written yet and going forward puts an album out and realizes that half of the money needs to go back to this thing that he signed 20 years ago when he was desperate for rent or whatever. Um, so you just can't trust your friends is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Uh, no music is actually free. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, and these people, it's easy to contact folks once you find out who owns these things, but like in this case, I would just keep moving and look for a song that has two sides, master, publishing. Normally, the artist owns the master and some group, uh, some conglomerate owns the publishing. Very rarely is it the same person. Uh, publishing is a really good source of income for musicians, and so it makes sense for them to have it brokered through someone else, but... Um, yeah, you just have to look that stuff up. You can't trust people to say, like, use whatever you want. Um, the other thing with licensing is that there's terms that are negotiable that you should know about, um, and they have to do with how long you want to use the track, not how long in the piece, sometimes that matters, but for how long do you want to be able to play this on your show? So some people put a year limit, some people put three year limits. That means you have to like trash it off of iTunes after three years or sign a new contract. Most people want to go for what's called in perpetuity, meaning forever and ever and ever. The other thing is what medium you're going to be working in. And, and you can say, oh, you know, this is just for podcasts. But what happened, I'll tell you a little story about This American Life. What happened there was when we first started making the show, we were selling cassette tapes of the show to listeners. Um, we had a guy that worked part-time just duplicating cassettes to send them out. And so all of our contracts with music, with artists, with anyone coming on the show just said, like, I license you to sell this as cassettes. And then CDs came around <laughs> or became more popular, basically. So we had to go back and get new licenses from everyone. And then podcasts came out and we had to go back again. And so the wording then is all media, not real or imagined. Um, and then that's a real term. Um, so anything you could think up in the future, a way of sharing audio and to have it in perpetuity um, throughout the universe. So that covers Mars. That's a real thing. So, <laughs> but that gets really expensive. Uh, and a couple of shows that I've worked on actually at MTV, we did have to promise like, okay, we'll only play this for a year and then it goes in the trash and no one will ever see it again. It will only be on TV. We will never put it on the web. We'll never make a, a you know, radio version of this. This will not be adapted into any movies. There were, they won't use clips at the VMA. It was just like to afford like one Skrillex track was like making all of these concessions, which as an artist is 
kind of a bummer because you want your art to live, you know? And so you kind of have to decide how important it is to get the broccoli song versus how important it is for you to be able to own your art for a long time. Um, so yeah, so the ASCAP service is called ASCAP Clearance Express, A-C-E. And you can look at any song and they'll tell you everybody that's involved um, in the ownership. So... Um, Here's an example of uh, what the music libraries will give you that composers can as well, but one reason that I really like going to music libraries is, okay, so this is a file, one song called Adapt, um, and there's the main version of the song, but there's also underscores and, and versions that have no drums, versions that have no strings, versions that have, you know, that are slowed way down, um, really quiet versions, really loud, big versions, and then these things called stings and stems, which stems are just like one instrument that's used in the song, just the isolated, and a sting is like the da 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 da, -da thing at the end. Um, so on a lot of these music libraries, they give you all of that. Um, it's a little more expensive than just licensing the one track, but again, call them and try to work it out. What's really nice about a song that has this many variations is that you can license just this one song and make it all the way through a half an hour show on just that because the, the, there's so much differentiation between the pieces. So I'm going to play just a couple of versions of this for you right now. So here's the main, so I love this song so much. So every instrument you hear in that song, you can find a version in, the, in this library of just, just the banjo or just the drums. Um, here's another kind of bigger mix of that song. It's less of a mix in the beginning, but then when it changes... So you can kind of picture through uh, an episode or through a piece, kind of bringing this back, um, and then here's a sting. And you could use that for just like a little break in between something. And anyway, it's just a really, I, I love this way of mixing <laughs> because it allows you to kind of create a theme, come back to things, but not bore, bore the listeners by like exactly repeating the same thing over and over again. And that sting is one of, there's one sting, three kind of like longer um, stings, and this, this one has a, there's some that have like 30 variations. So just explore around and um, try to have fun with that stuff. I, I get a lot, of, a lot of use out of one song from, this is from Audio Network, by the way. Um, so what do I do when I found the music? Uh, Decide how much music to use, and my opinion is not that much. <laughs> I can find, I, there's some shows that have just wall-to-wall -wall music, and for, for, this is just a taste thing, but for me, that you know when you're reading a book sometimes, and you're like, you read 10 pages, and you're like, oh, what did I just read? I don't remember any of that. I was just kind of zoning out. That's what music does to me sometimes when there's too much of it, is I actually start listening to the music, and then I'm like, oh, crap, I have to rewind two minutes. I don't, I've completely lost the thread. So... I like to use music sparingly but forcefully, um, making really conscious choices of where things should go, uh, and not just using so, not just using music because the story tells you you have to. Uh, <laughs> so, for example, there's a thing called diegetic and non-diegetic music, and diegetic music is music that's happening in the story, yeah. like people are hearing it. I feel like people use diegetic music and keep it going way too long sometimes. All you need is like a five second sound up of somebody like driving by in a car with music or whatever to kind of set the mood, but you know, it doesn't need to overwhelm the story. Non-diegetic music is more like scoring, like, you know, like stuff that goes under a film score. And again, if you want to keep that 
a lot of that in. Just try to make it a simple song. Don't have people singing in the background or whistling or doing anything that's going to distract from the person talking. Um, and for me, I try to keep it under two minutes at most for one track. Usually, like, a minute and a half is even pushing it. As far as how short a piece can be, it doesn't really... It can be like a split second, like that five second thing we just heard. So um, also, you know, you have to decide on the mood of your piece. Do you want to play against it? Do you want to play with it? Are you trying to make a sad moment sadder? Are you trying to make it seem lighter? Um, and search your music out that way. And then timing, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and the perfecting the mix. So just my, bigger, my biggest note on perfecting the mix is to not mix in headphones. Mix in monitors um, with the music part. Edit in headphones, mix in monitors. The reason is because in headphones, um, music kind of stands out more, and you want to listen to it as if someone was like driving in their car or listening to it in their house. Um, and if you, you can tell the difference between headphones and, headphones and monitors because one, when you switch from headphone mixing to monitors, you're like, where did my music go? <laughs> like, I can't hear anything. So, um, so it's just better to mix that way. Um, all right. So, scoring in action. I mean, we heard a little bit of this music. So here are some things music can do um, that we talk about a lot in mixing and in producing shows. One, move it along. When somebody's just talking, you have to have this information in your piece. It needs to get out there, but it's boring and this person's going on for forever. Or you have a huge chunk of script that's necessary to move the, the story and necessary for the story, but is just way too much of one person talking. Um, that is one way that music is used very well and, and frequently, I think, in podcasting. Um, Another thing is to emphasize an emotion of whatever sort. Maybe there's a very emotional piece of tape, but the person isn't quite giving it to you. You can just put some strings under it. Um, and then also there are moments, plenty of moments in your show where people just need a break to like absorb a ton of facts that just got thrown at them or because they're, they need to laugh for a second or they need to cry for a second or you, know, or you have a mid-roll ad. <laughs> So um, here's some examples of how to use music in these three ways. This first one is uh, the like somebody's talking a lot and you're just like get you just need to speed it up a little bit. Here's me when I was in the business, you know. Was, here's me and John Travolta doing staying alive. There's Stallone. Here's me and Stallone doing scene together. Here's me and Natalie Wood. Aww. Here's me and her. Dolly Parton. Yeah. Here's me, and there's uh, the gold digger that he was married to. My rock and roll band. This is me here. I got a bunch of pictures. I don't know where they went, but this we played with open for Three Dog Night at the time. So that's like a nonsense piece of tape, right? But <laughs> and could be potentially boring, but with the music, it's like, oh, maybe I should be paying attention to this. This might be important information for the story that's to come. Um, whereas if it was just kind of that guy rambling on on his own, you would be like, I don't even know what he's talking about. This guy is just a blowhard. It is important for the story, which you'll hear next year. Um, this, I'm, this next example, I went way over the top, you guys, and I apologize, um, but it just shows you, like, how much music can do um, to a piece that, of tape that's already very emotional. But if you really want to make people cry, um, try this kind of technique. Uh, I also, in this piece, gave the listener a break because it is kind of heavy. Um, so those two examples here. Bobby worked her and I called 911. So when they got, you know, they got a pulse, but she was already brain dead. So after three days, four days in the hospital, her body just shut down. We just, just you know, there's no, no point. And I never thought I'd see one of my kids, you know, seeing one of my kids die in front of me. Oh. At least I get to say, give Jesse a kiss and a hug and say goodnight. There's some kind of closure, but... Ugh. 
Um, <laughs> so I don't know if that sounded exactly like This American Life, but it wasn't. It's just a piece of tape I have laying around. Um, so, yeah, the, that song was actually from Audio Network. Um, it, that change that happened at the end there, where you have the melody, the key change, that's what I'm talking about, you know, being necessary for kind of a dynamic song to mix with. Um, you, you need somewhere for the song to go. If that had just been dun, 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 and then that came up in the clear, it would not do much <laughs> for you. So you, you kind of need the shift and the change to happen um, in the clear. So, all right. I'm gonna talk about changing the mood now. So we've, you can use music to move things along, you can use music to slow things down, kind of the opposite of what we heard in that first clip. Use music to emphasize an emotion, to give your listeners a break for a minute. And then you can also use music uh, to uh, underline or counter uh, an emotion or, uh, you know, like a feeling that's happening. If there's like some, a lot of times I use like news, like hard driving news kind of <laughs> music, like that sounds like breaking at five um, underneath something that's like totally unimportant. Uh, just to be funny. So you can, you know, however you want to use it, but sometimes you use the opposite kind of music that you need, or you use really sad music during a super hilarious moment, and that, you know, just changes the entire story. Um, or to add emphasis to some part of your piece. So um, here's an example of just some raw, uh, some raw tape from last season of uh, the Tinder podcast DTR. We still pass it around, like, as a joke. Someone will be like, it's an emergency, need the dick pic, and someone will like find it and send it. Pick can that you, we still can send. Can you ask for it? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta. Need the DP, it's an emergency. It's urgent. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> someone says, I got you. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> How can I miss it? It's a fucking Empire State Building of a dick. Dear God, that is terrifying. Okay, so at the end she said, dear God, that is terrifying. Um, and I mean, that tape stands alone, as you can tell, but, but to make it more fun, I was just playing around. This is not how it aired on the show, but just as an example in the room here. Um, to play off of the Dear God, That's Terrifying, here's this version of scoring. We still pass it around, like, as a joke. Someone will be like, it's an emergency, need the dick pic, and someone will, like, find it and send it. Pick can that you, we still can send. Can you ask for it? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta. Need the DP, it's an emergency. Okay. Um, <laughs> someone says, I got you. Oh, there it is. <laughs> How could I miss it? It's a fucking Empire State Building of a dick. Dear God, that is terrifying. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> Coming after you, that terrifying Empire State Building of a dick. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so obviously music can change, change the feeling of a moment. Um, here's another just playing up the jokiness. We still pass it around, like, as a joke. Someone will be like, it's an emergency, need the dick pic, and someone will, like, find it and send it. Pick can that you, we still can send. Can you ask for it? Yeah, I gotta, I gotta. Need the DP, it's an emergency. It's urgent. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> someone says, I got you. Oh, there it is! <laughs> How could I miss it? It's a fucking Empire State Building of a dick. Dear God, that is terrifying. Stupid. So stupid. Um, <laughs> but you get the point. Uh, okay, so um, this is just, this is my last big note is my note on timing. Um, be purposeful with your ins and outs with music. Um, sometimes I hear mixes where the, the music comes in like right on a word to the 
point where you miss the word <laughs> that it's supposed to be underlining. So go a half a second before or a half a second after, but be purposeful. Don't just throw your music in thinking, I need music in this section. Um, so I'm just going to put it in as soon as someone starts talking and take it out as soon as they're done talking. Um, it, music can serve a better function than that, which is art. Um, and again, longer isn't better. Um, you know, you can, one, one really nice technique is to use one song, start it, have it subtly fade away while someone's still talking, and then ring it back. You don't have to have it be in there the whole two minutes, you know? Um, but just make sure that whatever choices you're making about whether to have it come up in the clear, where the music starts, where the music ends, that they're like very thoughtful choices. <laughs> I listen to a song, when I'm mixing, I listen to the song, I get it in my head, then I turn it off, then I listen to the piece where I'm thinking the song might go, and I kind of have the song in my head, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm hearing, okay, there. <laughs> That's a technique, I don't know if anybody can actually use that. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you can keep it in your mind and listen through the piece and just say, does it really need to be here? Um, and oftentimes the answer is no. Uh, okay, so, we have time for um, questions. If anybody has questions, or some mics up front, just come on up and we'll go through. Hi. Hi, my name is Jasmine. Hi, um, Jasmine. I have the Avowed podcast, and I don't use music very often, but when I do, I want to be intentional with it. Mm -hmm. um, and you were saying it was like 1000 to $5,000 for the monthly, you said, monthly subscription? A annual. Oh, sorry, annual. Yeah. Um, and then how long can you use the songs that Forever. you... Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's the whole purpose of the library is that they have a blanket um, license for in perpetuity, all media, all that stuff. Fantastic. So most of them do. You, I mean, you, they all have representatives you can get on the phone um, and chat through it with them and just say, no, I'm an independent podcast producer. I don't really have that kind of money. What can we do here? And they can say, oh, well, then we'll cap you at 100 songs or whatever, you know? So there's, it's really easy to negotiate that stuff. Great. Just Thank depends you. on how much you want to spend. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Shayna. Hi, Shayna. And my question is for a podcast that's more conversational, interview style, mm -hmm. how do you see, as opposed to the one that you just played of the woman talking about the loss of a child, for yeah. example, yeah. or it's more of a narrative, how do you see using music in that format? I use it um, in more like a, chat, like a chat show, like a chum cast kind of thing. Um, I would use it to change subjects when it doesn't happen naturally in the conversation or in a way that flows really well. Like if you want to end a subject, but the next thing that was said doesn't really go and you need to cut that out, give yourself a music break, you know? Also, um, theme songs are important in a chat show. You need something to start with, something to end with, and that can be the same thing if you want. Um, and nowadays, everybody needs to toss to a commercial, right? So you don't have to just say, we'll be back after the break, and then the commercial starts. You can take a little breather with some music there. Yeah. The last thing about what you said, if you have it for an intro, for example, if at some point you're going to change that intro, does that just ruin your brand, in your opinion? Wait, you mean the theme song? Yeah. yeah, I don't know. No, it doesn't ruin your brand. You could do a different theme song every year if you want. Is your show good? You know what I mean? Hopefully. It's kind of what matters. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jess. Hi, Jess. Um, my question is, um, does licensing, and I feel like the answer is yes, does it also apply if you sing a portion of a song like a cappella as, I don't know, like a joke or something in... So, oh, this brings up a good topic. So um, there's a thing called fair use. So people bring this up a lot. Like, oh, I only want to play like a little bit of the lyrics of this thing because it's what we're talking about and it's germane to the topic or whatever. Or like, I just need one person saying this one word and it's in this song and it'd be so perfect. Um, we don't know yet because podcasting is so new and only a few lawsuits have actually taken place. But unfortunately, fair use is a defense in court. It's not a justification for an action. So you won't be able to claim like, but I only used 10 seconds of it and it was for this reason until you're in court. Like you can still get sued. It doesn't prevent you from getting sued. Is that helpful? You can do whatever you want, yeah, yeah. but you might just lose your ass. So I'm, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's don't great. have it be the Rolling Stones or Prince. You know what I mean? They're, they're going to find you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, 
Uh, my name is Meg, and I had a quick question. I actually run um, a couple of independent uh, record labels specializing mostly in electronic music. And my question is, um, you know, can you speak to working with smaller indie labels that don't have so much red tape? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, we did that a lot with the television show for This American Life. We went to a lot of really small labels and just said, can we work something out with you? I work with Anticon a lot um, still and ask them. They have a lot of music that is not instrumental, but they'll pull out lyrics and send me you know, a whole album. And then I license it like anything else, but not for as much as you know, Tears for Fears wanted what that one time, which was $40,000 for one song. Yeah. Hi, I'm Misha. Hi. I wanted to know if you ever use music as a motif, like in films, where it reappears to indicate something. And if not, do you recommend using it for certain purposes? I do. I love that. Yeah. Like every time this character comes on the scene, we hear this, this song. And what I like to do, that's the example I was showing you with that adapt song, how there's so many different variations. Um, that can let you mix it up a little bit so it's not like ding, ding, this character is back, you know, <laughs> you can kind of do it in a more elegant way, but yeah, I love, I love a motif, I love, you know, every time we enter this setting, this, this, you kind of hear this, this melody happening, um, that can be really fun, yeah, just a couple more, and then we'll be out of here, guys, hi. I'm Madeline, and I have no money, I'm trying to license a song from a specific band, and I went to high school with the band, but they're signed to a label. Should I re be respectful of their procedures or just try and go right to the band? The band doesn't own it. Okay. So you can go to the... This is what I was saying about your, you know, your boyfriend that ends in a band or whatever. The band, if they're with a label, the chances are they are not 100% owners of all of their music. Um, you can, if they have a good relationship with their publisher and their label, um, you can say to the band, hey, I want to license your song. Can you call your publisher and the label and tell them you'll take like little to no money for it because it's for me? And occasionally they have that power. But a lot of publishers don't know their artists and don't do that. So it really depends on where their publishing is. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask them to, to um, advocate for you, but they can't actually just give you the music. Yeah. Thank you. Unless they're like, nobody's ever heard of them and no, they're not on a label. Like if it's a cassette That's tape that they made in the garage. <laughs> Call the label then. I mean, I'm sure they would just love the publicity. A lot of labels will give you stuff for really cheap they, if they're small labels because they want to get their stuff out there. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kat. I'm from Colorado and Kat. I have a two-part question. Uh -huh. So I'm starting, like everybody, a podcasting production company and co-working space for podcasters. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering for um, rights, if my company has a subscription, how much does that extend to other people who are part of my network? And the second part is like, let's say you hire an audio engineer, and they have a membership to a library, and they're adding in music. Do I get to be protected by them? And it really like, how does it expense? Like, it really expense. depends on the company. I mean, mm -hmm. if you uh, so for This American Life, we only have licenses for This American Life, even though American Whatever is like an umbrella company that has S Town Serial and This American Life. You just have to negotiate that with the with the com with the library um, and with or if you're licensing something, you need to negotiate the breadth of your contract. Like, what all does it cover? So, like, ten friends from here who all want to get together and get a membership, for example. Probably not going to happen <laughs> if you guys aren't associated in some way. But the co-working space might be a way to get around that, and you yeah. just have to be honest with them. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Hi, I'm Susie. Um, I work at a station, NPR affiliate, and I'm helping other producers use music. We have a blanket license with APM, yeah. so a lot of people have access to this library. Yeah. And there's, you know, differing uh, philosophies on when to bring music in, whether it's a news feature or a longer piece. Yeah. And you know, one of our editors was saying, well, you have to introduce something within the first two minutes, or it's super jarring to have music come in like four minutes into a piece. That's I mean, their I was just opinion, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's art, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I, sometimes it's, it can be jarring, but other times you, you, you're using it for a specific purpose. Maybe it's just like a break in between two halves of a story. Then if that's all you're using music for, you don't need to have it in in the first two minutes. Or maybe it's diegetic. Maybe the music comes in because it's happening in the story. You don't need to have it start just so people are prepared for when it actually right. is happening in the story. You know, if you're using it to like 
signify like a nightclub scene or whatever. There no, there's no need to have music before that. So I think whatever serves the story best, you know, and be artful. I don't think there's hard and fast rules other than the ones you make for yourself. <laughs> Great, Which are all the ones I was talking about today. Um, all right, I think we're all set, guys, unless there's any... Okay, yes. No. Right. So um, radio stations pay into BMI and ASCAP, and ASCAP, that's a pool of money, and then um, you, submit your, you submit your cue sheets, and they divide it all up among all the artists, right? So if everybody's writing down Dram and Lil Yachty, because they use broccoli, they get a big chunk of the pool of, that everyone's paying into for FM, because we all own the radio waves, right? So we kind of just share the money there. But once you're a podcast, you're a product, that can be traded around and possessed, and that changes everything. So it's actually been a problem at This American Life because for the longest time we were not a podcast. So we made 500 episodes with whatever the hell we wanted, and now we're having to replace every single piece of music from the last 15 years. No, not 15 years, 20. Oh, my God, 20 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, so it's very different. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Go have fun. to intro the next panel. Uh, up next, we have Creativity Doesn't Just Happen, a conversation about being creative and getting things done. Hi.